Um, one of the things is, the cool thing about going to space is so many countries decide to end up working together in order to get there, even though politically or socially they're at times not happiest with each other. But we have people from different nations in the ISS all of the time. We work with people in many different scientific fields all of the time. And so this might be one way that we could help bring the world together just a little bit more. So that's always a good reason. Curiosity, we've all been curious, right? You guys wouldn't be here if you weren't curious. You guys wouldn't leave home if you weren't curious. You guys wouldn't spend money on anything other than food if you weren't curious, right? You wouldn't travel if you weren't curious. So curiosity is something that's been driving humanity for since humanity has been thinkable, smart enough to think about new things. So we're not just like ants and stuff roaming around looking for food all the time. We're actually like exploring and doing new things. Leading that to an adventure. Usually when you're curious about something, you go to, I don't know, a national park. Where's the last time you did an adventure? Like every weekend pretty much. Where was the last one? Uh, Snow Canyon. Snow, Snow Canyon. Canyon. So you went on an adventure. Were you curious about what it was about? Yeah. Yeah. And did it turn out well? It's pretty cool. And did you, you didn't die? Nope. Okay, good. Uh, you? When was your last adventure? Skiing. And you didn't die? Or broke the, broke the leg or anything else? Nope, I'm still here. <laughs> okay. So adventures are something that we all like to take, um, whether it means skiing, hiking, going to the beach, scuba diving, you know, even walking down the street, you know, whatever. So you go to these places, you want to go there, you don't just want to like go to the, I don't know, the, the bottom of the canyon and be like, hey, and then go home. You don't want to go to the top of the, the mountain and be like, cool, it goes down. I'll just go right back down on the, yeah. No, you want to explore it. You want to go there, walk around, go down and all this other stuff because that's part of it. You don't just go to somewhere and look at what it looks like there. So it's like going to Mars. We can see it. We're not just going to be like, cool, it's red. And then just not go there if we you know, have a purpose. You know, like we've been to almost every planet so far in one method or another. And so Mars is just the next step. So to get humans beyond the moon, beyond Earth. So those are kind of like way, why or reasons to think about it. So if we didn't want to explore anything, we probably would have never gone past the birthplace of humanity. It just would have stayed there wherever it was, Middle East or Africa or wherever that was. So in order for us to want to go somewhere or do something, you want to know a little bit about it. You're not going to go into the canyon without knowing what kind of things might decide to jump out and eat you or without knowing, oh, that might be a dangerous place, so I need to make sure that I'm walking, you know, have proper walking shoes, you know, anything like that. You don't want to just go down a random hill that could just have a cliff on the one side, right? You want to know where you're going to go. You have to know about it in order to get there. So we have to know a little bit about Mars. That way we can prepare to go there. So does anybody have any idea what their atmosphere is like on Mars? Very, very thin. Very thin. It's about a thousand times less dense than it is here on Earth, which means there would. So it's uh, mostly comprised of carbon dioxide, not a very lot. Um, that's one huge problem for humans to rely on oxygen. So that's one thing that you'll have to think about in order to get there. Next, the landscape's kind of like, in some places, really rugged. So if you want to go there and explore, you're going to have to figure out where the best place is that you could go easily. Because it's not like you want to take your rover or even walk across a lot of this stuff. So do you have something that could drive over that really easily, no. especially on another planet? Mountain biking on Mars. Maybe, but what if you got a flat tire? You can't just air it up. It's not enough air. It would take way too long. So that's something you need to think about, the landscape. So when you're thinking about the kind of um, things you need to wear there, it would be kind of not too great just to have something really thin that could tear easily if you tripped over a rock. So 
something that would be in, needed to be invented would be maybe a type of uh, type of suit that is not as easily torn. So that could be something like a new Kevlar type material that is really um, movable, that allows you to bend over, pick things up and stuff, but is also really um, doesn't tear easily. Next is this climate. So a really hot summer day at the equator on Mars gets to about 60 degrees. That's about as hot as it ever gets there. Average is negative 60, if you take the whole average of the entire planet. But even at night during the summer, it still dips down to negative 100. Which means, what? What do you think you would have to have if you don't want to use the yeah, heated warm shoes, clothes, heated uh, enclosure, whatever you're going to be in. So yeah, warm clothes only get you so far, unless you have like, I don't know, that thick of insulation on them. So that's not really feasible. Um, even that type of enclosure with an oxygen. But what if you had to go outside for something? Or what if you were stuck somewhere? Well, the suits are heated now for space walks. But for how long? Five, six hours, some yeah. of those longer ones. Yeah. But they are tethered to the yeah. space station still. And yeah. the suits for that kind of thing are really heavy. They're a couple hundred pounds because of the batteries and everything. So a couple hundred pounds on Mars would be less because there's less gravity, but it's easy in space because there's you know, zero gravity. But to have somebody carry around like 200 pounds of batteries even on Mars would be kind of taxing for a while. So. Maybe new thermal technology needs to be built for those kind of situations. Um, or maybe new battery technology, so it's not as heavy. Or maybe a higher density, energy density. So any of that would work. Okay. Um, you know, these I just threw this in there because uh, that last one was a dust devil on Mars. And it does occur, so you, you might have to deal with dust blowing around a little bit. These are carbon dioxide clouds floating around. So you can kind of see that, you know, that's kind of the climate there. Um, part of the climate is, you know, you got to be able to figure out how to generate the things you need. One of the things is water. So this might be where you would go with water, but it's negative 200 degrees constantly. So it's not like you can really go and dig up some ice and bring it back to your base and everything's all happy. Um, and a lot of that is actually carbon dioxide ice, or dry ice. It's not like you can drink that. <laughs> makes some cool root beer though. <laughs> but you know, you gotta figure out where you can go to have what you need and to be able to survive. So this is another thing. So Mars does not have a magnetic field, so it's constantly being bombarded by uh, solar wind. But something they discovered recently was it Mars does have auroras in ultraviolet. <laughs> so it's not like we can see them, but it's still cool. But it also gets, uh, gives you the, the, the idea that it's even less safe because it has enough stuff coming to it, uh, enough radiation to cause auroras. So that's another problem is once you get on Mars, you know, if you get you know, the cold taken care of, if you get the water taken care of, if you get the oxygen taken care of, you know, you're still going to be bombarded by radiation. And if you're bombarded by radiation too much, is anybody a superhero here? Does anybody know anybody that turned into a superhero after getting radiation sickness? This is what you just No. So it's a sure death. <laughs> it's pretty sure, or a really slow one, at least. Really slow, but also early. All right. So. There's always problems doing anything. You know, when when you go traveling somewhere, what's the problems that you had to? You need to make sure you have enough gas to get to and from where you're going. Right. Food and water. Food, water. What are some other things that might come up? A tent, rain gear. Are those problems though? Problems. What could go wrong with some of that stuff? Wild bison. Wild bison, right? You know, you get too close to a wild space bison, it might run into your spaceship. <laughs> Anybody else? Ever had problems traveling somewhere? Uh, you need to make sure your vehicle's equipped properly, equipped with spare tire, spare
spare tire. You have to have redundancy there because you don't have any means for repair. Right. You would probably want to make sure that all your mechanical everything is working right mm -hmm. and top notch. Because you don't want to take off on a road to road trip to California or you know to the East Coast with bald tires. Because it's likely going to fail, right? So no bald tires going to Mars. Okay. So a lot of problems actually. One of them, just getting to space is a big problem, and it's been a problem since. Uh, we've been trying to get there, so let's uh, check this out. We haven't had anybody die during liftoff yet, at least this close to the ground. Air launch team, launch team, be advised, stay at your consoles, everyone in the LTC, maintain your business. So that is one problem. Actually getting into space is a big issue. You know, there's at least one or two rockets that blow up every year. You know, that hasn't been a huge cost in life so far, but it's a huge cost in money. Potentially, could be a cost of life. So the next one is, once you get into space, there could be things that go wrong. I'm sure most of us have seen this movie. Don't tell them you're showing this. So luckily, only nuclear things use those old computers anymore. Um, nuclear launch site. But one of the problems is going into space, you might have something go wrong, like what happened on the Apollo 13. Um, they made it back through a lot of really smart thinking and everything, but you know you can't have everything thought of. There's always something that somebody hasn't thought of that could go wrong. So. What you need is people on the ground and in the actual spacecraft that are really smart at coming up with good ideas to fix stuff like really quick. Because that could be the, that few minutes of somebody coming up with something could be the difference between everybody dying and everybody living. So having redundancy, yes, that was another good point. Um, if you have systems like this where you can bypass something that goes wrong, that would be great. That way it's, you know, it doesn't become such a large issue, but that's definitely problematic on any travel. So these are pictures taken from the International Space Station and one of the space shuttles of micrometeor impacts. So that's another problem. Flying around in space, there's still stuff left over. Otherwise, we wouldn't have meteors and meteor uh, shooting stars and all of that stuff. So this is what happens when something just slightly bigger than a grain of sand hits the window in the International Space Station. And the window is, you know, I think about that thick or something. It has multiple layers, so if it would have gotten through that one, it would have fixed the other ones. This is a hole that was caused by one in the space shuttle. Luckily, they have the same thing around the entire space shuttle and the International Space Station, where they have multiple layers. You know, the first layer is like something hits it, breaks it apart, reduces the amount of energy and the amount of mass hitting the next layer. Um, they're starting to think about using like Kevlar la layering and stuff on those. So, but you know, if something big enough hits the sp your spacecraft on the way there, then there's kind of no amount of stuff that's going to fix it or help stop it. Because you know what happens when things hit the Earth, big holes in the ground. 
But there is, um, like the ISS does have kind of a radar system and stuff to detect anything larger than, um, I think it's anything larger than like a baseball or something that can detect and they can do maneuvers to get out of its way. That would be something kind of intelligent to have on your spacecraft. But you also have to account for the amount of fuel that you may or may not burn on uh, doing maneuvers to get away from that stuff. So next. All right, so who's ever been on a trip with brothers or sisters? Family members, children. Is this kind of what it's like? Cadets Jimmy and I on a 36-year mission to the corner galaxy for a pack of gum. And I grow tired. I suspect Cadet Cindy had been plotting against me. So if that's anything like your trips have ever been, you know, that's something that you'd have to think about if you were to fly somewhere, be in a giant tin can with upwards of eight other people. You know, one of the problems is the psychological problems that humans can have in isolation and also being with, you know, stuck with people for you know, anywhere from three months upwards to the rest of your lifetime. Who wants to spend the, your entire life with five other people and nobody else? Space may not be the place for you. <laughs> so that's definitely one thing that people going into space have to think about. There's one other thing. If you can get past getting into space, getting through space, getting through psychology of humans, then there's always the Space Shuttle Columbia was going over North Texas. We're looking at a lot of things now that can control. And this was the shuttle going over North Texas at the time. It looked like a normal re-entry because the uh, shuttle would normally light up and re-entry because of the heat and the friction of the Earth's atmosphere. But then we began to see this. You'll notice here, it looks like you can see pieces of the shuttle coming off. Pieces of the shuttle coming off, and NASA, we can confirm, that the shuttle is behind schedule. It was to land in Florida. There you see what appears to be multiple pieces of the shuttle. So getting into Mars atmosphere is still as problematic as getting into Earth's atmosphere. So once you get to there, you just still need to make it to the ground. So the problem with these kind of things were um, this one was damaged in, on takeoff. Um, just even a piece of foam hit the heat shields underneath it. They weren't able to detect the problem until it was way too late. So one of the things that may need to be developed is kind of like a safety check of everything and the safety systems before they're put into uh, or sent up into the ground. Um, because this was just a small piece about that big that was missing on the wing and it destroyed the whole thing. So. You don't want to go that far, that long, with that expense and have a small hole this big, you know, end your mission. So these are all things that you need to make sure that are taken care of. That way, at least getting to Mars and on Mars is a success. So now how would we do it all? That's a huge question because <coughs> we've never been beyond the moon, at least physically as humans. So we don't have the uh, USS Enterprise, at least this version of it. So we don't have spaceships like this. It's definitely off, that's at least 300 years away, according to movies and TV. <laughs> so we don't even have this. This is like the Mars <coughs> spacecraft that was on, um, what's that movie called again? The Martian. <laughs> so, looks pretty cool. Um, they would probably end up building this in space, but there are some problems with this. Can anybody point some problems out that you might have? Because this is still a little bit fictiony. So, part of it was this little ring right here, where they had their, um, you know, their fake gravity and stuff. 
it would either have to be spinning really fast or it would have to be really large. Um, because if it's not sufficiently large, then your body will feel the effects of having a different ex acceleration on your legs than your head, and you would pass out or get really sick. So having that kind of thing, if it's not sufficiently large, it would cause more problems than it would solve. But the re why do you think they want to have something like that, though? Well, it regenerates without gravity. But why do you need gravity? Do we need gravity to survive? It makes exercise a lot easier. Well, yeah, but why do you need exercise in space? Bones start to dissolve. Bones, bones start to dissolve. Your muscles start to, you know, go away. Your eyeballs, you know, get mal malformed. Your brain starts to swell. Your heart starts to lose its energy or lose its strength. You kind of start to die. <laughs> so that's why. The idea of having artificial gravity is kind of an important thing to do, or trying to figure out how, as humans, we could live in space and not fall apart by the time we get to Mars and back into even lower gravity um, than you would have here. Because once we get to Mars, we'd have gravity again, but it's, you'll still have those same kind of problems. You'll be there for a year, you'll have gravity, but your bones will still, you know, be, your bones and muscles will still be become adjusted to that lower gravity. And when you come back to Earth, it feels like there's an elephant sitting on you. So that's, that's problematic. Um, so that's possible. Another way, we have to land on Mars. This was tried but by the European Space Agency, but the, uh, um, it didn't survive. So you don't want to kind of bounce around the surface of the planet. A lot of problems with bouncing. So, we as uh, super smart Americans came up with this. So you use you slow down uh, using a parachute, get to a certain spot, then use thrusters, um, and it kind of slowly lands you to the ground, nice and soft. Hopefully, if everything goes well. Um, the most recent, the InSight lander, uh, did kind of like a kind of a sky crane thing. This thing was up here, and then it kind of lowered it down on the surface, and then blew away off to the side. So, you know, this is likely what would happen if we were to do it with uh, humans, but this thing is, you know, smaller than this room. In order for us to land with everything we need, it's going to be a lot larger, right? So which means the parachute's going to be larger and the thrusters are going to have to be larger. Problematic, maybe? Lots of extra stuff to carry. So another thing, when you get to the surface, if we can recycle on Earth, why can't we recycle in space? Astronauts need to recycle as much as they can if they want to survive on Mars. So wouldn't it be cool if we could take some of the materials the astronauts aren't using and recycle them to build 3D printed habitats where astronauts can live and work? Pretty cool, right? We want your help to make this dream a reality. Help us turn this into this, and we'll turn your idea into this. Think you can solve this challenge? Show NASA's centennial challenges you got what it takes, and help us take the next giant leap in space recycling. Anybody want to make some money? <laughs> so that's the thing, is trying to figure out how to survive on Mars using what's on Mars. Now that leads us into how would you survive on the surface? So there's not much, to, not much on Mars right now. Like everything that we we would need would have to come from Earth right now because we don't have any technology to build stuff on Mars. So when they were talking about 3D printing technology, well, we can print it in stuff like this big. But to build an entire house or an entire habitat, you know, you're going to need something a little bit different. So let's check this picture out. So we can figure out some stuff in this picture. So they've, they've already done that in, in Japan. They they have big robot printers and they printed an entire house. Yeah. Yeah. But it took them like three, four months. To yeah. Okay. So we can figure out a bunch of stuff just from this picture. So first of all. 
we would need power, right? Is there oil on Mars? Unlikely. We don't know. Could we mine it if it was there? Not very easily. Okay. So there's one main source that is off the list. Uh, what would be the most abundant source of energy on Mars? Probably solar. Solar, yeah. right. So, oops, went a little ahead. We'll get there. So, looking at this, they have kind of a solar farm similar to what's in California, where they're all kind of pointed to one spot, creating heat and creating solar power at the same time. It might be a good thing, but how are you going to have that at night? Good batteries. Good batteries, but batteries weigh a lot. 12 volt, what is it, like 300 amp capacity battery weighs about 60 pounds. And to run an entire thing like this, I mean, imagine how many pounds of battery you would have to have with our current technology to run this for a single night and then be able to recharge efficiently over and over again for hopefully a few years, maybe. So the technology kind of isn't really there. You know, even the Tesla batteries take how long to charge? And they only have how much capacity? So it'd be really expensive to send batteries, basically. Paul, can I get you to say hello to Jody Patterson in the room? Hello, Jody. Patterson in Moab. What's that? Jody Patterson in Moab. You Jody see? Patterson in Moab. Okay, cool. Thanks for joining us. So to give you an idea, currently it costs about $10,000 for every single pound of something that you want to send into space. So sending a single battery into space, like your regular car battery, is $60,000. Well, no, $600,000, because I forgot a zero. So $600,000 for one battery to run some lights for about four hours. Not efficient, not cost effective. Um, so we have to figure out a new lighter, higher energy density battery for this purpose. So other things, okay, so we see food down here, all right? So could we just send like a farm full of cows and have cheeseburgers every day? Not if they cost a few million dollars a piece to send there. And also for all of the other stuff that would be needed. Maybe you could send some cow fetuses there. That would be cheap, but then you'd have to produce more food than they produce in order to feed them. So. I usually suggest that probably the people that are going to go there are going to be vegetarians. So if you can't live without a cheeseburger, then Mars probably isn't the place for you. <laughs> so another thing that you can see here is like how they're growing food. So um, they can't grow outside, no atmosphere. So there's a, a fair amount of CO2, but it's still not at the right density. and It's also really too cold. So you'd still have to have um, indoor farming like this. So that means more types of resources and, uh, in order to actually have that. So there's going to be some invention with that. You know, one of the things that you could possibly go with is like hydroponics, um, but still having that amount of water that you need to have for hydroponics is still going to be really expensive to send there. So yeah. Um, you do notice that a lot of this is underground. Anybody want to guess why? Radiation. Radiation. So a lot of radiation outside of gamma radiation can be blocked by you know just a few inches of soil. So, but how are we going to cover everything with dirt? Can we bring send an ex excavator there? Dump it all or a bulldozer? That'd be a really expensive bulldozer. Or maybe like one of those small ones that, well, I can't remember, bobcats or whatever. Yeah, they might work. But that's going to be a problem to figure out is how we can do this. And one, one way is maybe there are caves or something that we can find um, and put those in there. Um, so, but looking at this picture, you can also figure out the type of people that need to go there. So we're not probably going to send just some random game player. It's like, I play 
World of Warcraft. I can go to Mars, right? Not likely. So looking at this picture, what do you guys think? Who is going to be the likely candidates to go to Mars? Scientists. What kind? Mechanical engineering types. Mechanical engineers? Women under, the, women under the weight of 120 pounds. <laughs> that would be super cheap, <laughs> yes. How about geologists and biologists? Biologists, <laughs> yes. Geologists, yes. Botanists. Botanists. Good. So that way you can grow food. You can learn how to use the soil to grow the food. You can learn how to analyze the soil in different places so you know where to get all the proper elements because Mars soil is not, does not have the right chemical composition to grow food right now. And also doesn't have bacteria, which is really important too. And you kind of also learned that when Mark Rotney was doing his potato growings. So in the movie, he spent a lot of time, you know, using human waste to use as fertilizer. Um, so that's a possibility, but you've got to get the human waste from somewhere, which means you're going to have to send food first. Um, let's see. So we got a good list. You guys think maybe uh, doctors? Because, you know, it's like, oh, you broke your arm? I only know about plants. <laughs> Not really helpful. So doctors, geologists, botanists. Um, what's that? Cooks. Cooks? Well, just, I guess you uh, can yeah, teach everybody to everything. warm up their own <laughs> stuff. But no, cooks would probably be good. Um, maybe in the long run. Firefighters. Firefighters. Hopefully there's not too many fires on Mars. You just open the door and it extinguish itself. <laughs> maybe. Unless you're in the room. It extinguish a lot of other things. <laughs> it's true. So um, a lot of different people are going to have to go um, with a lot of different fields. Um, but the thing about it is I'm pretty sure the botanist is still going to have to learn some of the, the engineering side of it. In case something goes wrong with the engineer, and they're not alive anymore. So there's going to be a lot of cross-training, which is something that occurs in NASA al already. So you don't, you have like your experts, and then you have people that know systems maybe well enough to fix something if something went wrong. So this is the soil on Mars. Um, it's not sufficient for growing anything, so we would have to bring our own types of fertilizer with us to seed the, the soil. Um, you guys notice the little bits of white in here, so they kind of think that there may potentially be water under the surface. Um, that is most likely uh, carbon dioxide, um, but maybe further down from there might be actually water that you could be using for building a hydroponic system. So, you know, potential for stuff. Um, this is something that is, has been kind of invented, and they're currently researching it. It's called MOXIE. So this is a way to use CO2 from the atmosphere and using stuff on Mars to create enough gener uh, energy to actually make oxygen out of the CO2. So this is something that's currently being invented. Another thing that's being invented is a way to change the iron oxide in the dirt into oxygen and iron. That way you can use the iron for building materials and oxygen for living. So that's another invention that people are working on. So these things are occurring right now, so if you want to build something and be part of it, you've got to hurry up and jump on the train, or you're going to be left behind. You should jump on, you should jump on a spaceship, actually. So this is something that was invented by, or kind of designed by, kind of like a four-wheeling kind of company. So they designed their own Mars rover. And you notice something interesting about the tires. They're not our standard tires that you air up. So they're made out of a, a composite material, which is strong. Um, you don't have to worry about blown tires because there's no air in them. And each one of these individual sections can be replaced if needed to be. So, you know, that's, this might be 
the way to go. This might be something that they're actually going to use on Mars. NASA has their own uh, rover that they're developing too. So this is kind of like a overly large hydro hydroponic system, but it could be something to design after for Mars once everything else is established. You know, if you start getting more and more people there, you're going to have to get more and more resources, more and water and everything, so this might be something that you have to end up building eventually, but it might be under a giant dome. So this is a hole on Mars. It, there might be actually caves and stuff on Mars that you could use for these underground things. So this is a picture of a hole on Mars. You can see down inside of there, there's some more uh, dry ice down there, carbon, di carbon dioxide ice. And so if we could find a location that is suitable for both the atmosphere, temperatures, and has enough of the resources that we would need near one of these holes, then it might be a good place to start a little home on Mars. So NASA needs you. So um, they're kind of figuring out who needs to be the first people to send, and who the next people to send, and who the people after that. Um, currently, we don't have any technology to get people back from Mars. Okay, so we can much more easily send people to Mars and send them onto the surface and just let them die. That's the easiest way to do it first. They can help establish all of these areas that we can set up in, the types of materials that are usable on the surface, are some of these experiments that people are coming up with, will they actually work on the surface? So you can do as much stuff as you want here on Earth, but is it going to be as effective and usable on another planet? So the first, pre first people that might go to Mars might be the first people to die on Mars. Anybody want to be the first person to die on Mars? No? We don't have any takers? Man, when I show this to kids, they're like, me! <laughs> <laughs> so an interesting thing about this is uh, um, Buzz Aldrin said, well, I'm old. I have really nothing else I can uh, you know, like do here on Earth, and I'm going to die anyway. So send me, send me being an old guy, send me to be the first people to die on Mars. So he, he suggested sending older people, 60s, 70 years year olds, that are still you know healthy and functional and walk around, but would also do well in a lower gravity environment, and send them, and then they could just be the first people to die on Mars. And I'm sure Buzz would love to be the first person to walk on the moon, come back, first person to walk on, the, on Mars, and then die there. <laughs> so, he, he kind of had that idea. So, it may not be the first generation or even the second generation of Marsonauts that go there that actually make it back to Earth. And there's a high likelihood that the first people actually trying to get there may not even make it. So, could you ever return? Currently, no. In the future, maybe. But, if you got to the got to the planet and you brought a telescope with you, you could see Earth and Mars through your telescope, or Earth and Moon through your telescope. So you could be the first Galileo on Mars. All right, that's all. <laughs> Any questions? I've heard that um, we could maybe one day figure out how to turn Martian regolith into rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. Any comments on that? Yeah, there's that same thing I was talking about with the iron oxide, turning that into iron and then oxygen. Um, you can still use that process to um, do it for other elements on the surface or other compounds and potentially turn that into usable fuel. But we don't have that invented yet. Mm -hmm. So that would be have to be invented and then tried out on Mars to make sure it works. And then maybe it would have enough fuel to get people back. There's already a process working in uh, Texas and in Germany where they suck in uh, atmosphere and uh, pull the CO2 out and then turn it into fertilizer. The Texas company is turning it into uh, fuel, mm -hmm. uh, any, any, any fossil fuel you want. The uh, but, but it costs, uh, it was just in the 
New York Times a couple days ago, but it, it costs like two thousand dollars. Yeah. A metric ton or something to, to process. And it's really energy intensive, which is something you don't have available on Mars either. So, turning to that question, so so there's the big controversy of launching Cassini and I think uh, Galileo because they had nukes on them. Nuke power, so so how big of a nuke is it going to take to to power all this stuff? Right, or <coughs> how many of them? Yeah. yeah. But the problem is right now, uh, the United States is running low on the plutonium that is used in those kind of things, and so there's actually not enough plutonium to make that an effective choice. So we would actually have to mine and then refine plutonium in order to yeah. make enough for it to do that, which means that we likely have to open some new uranium mines which have lots of environmental problems for Earth anyway, so, you know. Sure. Yeah. Or turn on a breeder reactor. <laughs> that too. I mean, yeah. it's a little bit easier. So how big of a nuke do they, I mean, how much, how much, how much, how much power do the prototype stations need? I don't know, I haven't read anything about the, how much power usage it would need, but it depends on how much you scale it, how many people you have, how much stuff is going on. So, so I'm not a, and you may need to uh, repeat the questions so the three people, on, uh, including Joe, who's watching over the internet, can, they might not be able to hear the questions, they're just hearing the answers. Um, so I'm not a big fan of Elon Musk, but, but what's his deal about going to Mars? I mean, I mean he's, he's got a bunch, he's got some pe people who volunteered to do the one-way trip, and so his, his plan is just one, one way, and... Yeah. yeah. I think his plan is, like... Elon Musk's plan to get to Mars is just to get to Mars. Um, not necessarily to do a lot of science or something, but just for the achievement. Yeah. So that could be the first mission. But why not go a little bit farther and actually do some of the science required to live on Mars while those people are volunteering to die for it? Right. So there's some short-sightedness in some of his stuff. But one thing I didn't mention is a lot of people like to talk about um, terraforming Mars. Um, but there are problems associated with that on its own. So first of all, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field to kind of push away a lot of the uh, solar wind that comes from the sun. And the solar wind and space are likely the two things that cause Mars to actually lose its atmosphere in the past anyway. So which means we'd always have to be coming up with new atmosphere off of the surface of Mars and replenishing it constantly so it doesn't float out into space. Um, so that right there puts a huge hamper on you know, terraforming it to an effect that is similar to what we would have on Earth. Um, we might be able to terraform caves underneath them, but then we would turn into marsh and mole, mole people like in the old uh, films from the 50s and 60s. <laughs> so we could be the next those. That would be probably easier because then you could seal your caves and everything like that to hold in your atmosphere for you. But Mars's gravity is what percentage of Earth's? I think it's about a third. Okay. If I remember right. So, you yeah. know. Problem is, is that there's no guarantees of terraform in any way. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of other problems. Uh, one of the other problems with even just the Martian soil is it might be similar to lunar soil where it's very, it has a lot of very fine particulates of kind of, it's kind of like glass that's created as um, meteors kind of come down and interact and heat up the, heat up the dirt and everything. And since it's not kind of a, uh, the weathering there isn't as smoothing as here, to, here as here on Earth, a lot of the particles, the dust particles and stuff, are very uh, sharp. So that leads to problems with human health because if you're getting all of these sharp micro particles coming into your lungs and stuff, it can lead to a lot of internal problems um, and for electronics and stuff like that too. So, you know, it may not be a, hab a very habitable planet for many more reasons than just the atmosphere. Any more questions? Any questions from the the folks at home? No, uh, I'm not seeing anything coming through. Okay. But we'll give him a second to type. Yeah. So, um, one thing, so what's up, I haven't been following what's up next for the next set of uh, NASA or international uh, probes going to Mars. 
have you have you written following that at all? Or um, I know the insight just landed. I'm not. I, I think there's two or three that are being planned, but planning missions and building them don't mean they're going to make it there for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I haven't. I'm not too keen on their details yet. There's a 2020 Mars rover. So where do you think the best place to look for life on Mars is? Um, the, uh, I mean, one of my frustrations, I mean, to my thinking is the best place to look is to drill underground or yeah. drill where we have a lo known water on subsurface ice. And well, that's the problem. I, I always get frustrated with this thing of, well, we'll drive the rovers around and see if we can find an exposed sediment. Yeah. And um, most, of, most of the life on Earth is, is, is subsurface bacteria by... Yeah. By mass, and the, it seems to me that would be the right place to look. If we the newest to. lander that they have there actually is going to drill down, I think, 16 feet. That's um, inside. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, if it's not at 16 feet in that area, it might be 40 or 50 or 150 feet in another area. But that starts to become very problematic if you're just sending robots there, because robots only have a certain capability of doing things right. Yeah, and so. That might be something that is more easily probed by people actually going there, but I would think it would be in the warmer areas, uh, the equatorial areas, just simply because it's not as cold. Right. And so a lot of bacteria, um, they can survive in fairly cold temperatures, but I don't think we've ever discovered anything that can is living at negative 200 degrees. As you Shelby, know. do you want to read Joe's question? Joe asks, when will the first humans go there? And he says, sorry, I missed most of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, well, we were supposed to have people on their way there right now. You know, in 2012, they were saying, yeah, we'll get, we'll get sent out there 2019. That's, we don't have that. We don't even have the proper spaceships to even get close to there yet. You know, uh, SpaceX is currently developing um, their Falcon Heavy, which will get some of the way there for some of the weight that needs to be there. But I personally think that we're at least five to 10 years off from the rocket technology and 15 to 20 for actually being able to live there and 20 to 30 before we actually are there. Um, I said five years ago, that would be 25 years from five years ago and I'm gonna extend that to an extra 10 years on top of that. Um, and it's not for the lack of trying, it's just for the lack of uh, availability of money and resources. And so, yeah, 20, 20 to 30 years, Joe. <laughs> As you go below the Martian surface, you would presumably get warmer, just like you do on Earth? I would think so, just because it's the same kind of forces acting. Mm -hmm. um, Earth does have an actual live core and everything. So it's probably never going to be as warm as what you would find on Earth. And given the amount of mass difference, it's not going to be as warm as you would have on Earth. Um, but, you know, you don't start getting those warming effects until you get at least 500 to 1,000 feet below the, below the surface. Um, there's a possibility of having underground lakes like we do on Earth, um, underground caverns full of water and everything like we do here. And that could easily harbor life. Um, it's probably not going to be anything, you know, very complex. At most, probably like shrimp type things, maybe moving around in there. Mm -hmm. But even that, you know, I think it would probably be more on the bacteria level. But it's had just as long to evolve into something as we have. So there might be Martian mole people under there. <laughs> um, so when we humans build a probe, we're putting our bacteria on it, and we send it to Mars, we can try to bake all the bacteria off the best we can. Yep. How are we going to first know for sure that we're looking at Martian bacteria? Well, I just actually read an article about that yesterday um, where uh, it was talking about the amounts of UV and how the UV is interacting with the perchlorates in Martian soil, making an extent, ex like even larger effect that UV has normally on bacteria, because normally if you put enough back, or UV on bacteria, it will kill it, right? But as they found, it interacts with the perchlorates in the, the ground 
and it makes it like 20 times more deadly to any bacteria. So basically anything on the surface, if it's like the bacteria we have on Earth, is likely going to be killed by that. So um, the problem is going to be like bacteria, like if you were to go to Mars and dig down, is the bacteria down there similar to this? And I think you would have to do look at like DNA, RNA type things in there. To, because if it has DNA, it's likely going to be different than anything that we have on Earth, um, if it's a DNA-based kind of bacteria. And if it's not, I wouldn't breathe it. But have you seen Prometheus? Have you seen life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's likely going to be comprised of, or composed of different uh, materials, um, different elements, but it's also going to be likely using a different chemical process to do its living. So do you think one of the first biological instruments that was then there, once we see maybe if there is simple organism uh -huh. stuff up there, would be like a gene sequencer to see if it's our DNA or foreign DNA? You know, it, it doesn't require a huge lab to do that, so sure. it would probably be something we could think about sending in the first one anyway. Um, and then it would be there if it ever came up. But you would probably want to do that anyway, because then you could see what kind of DNA damage is going on with humans as they're on the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of get a, maybe a graph of damage to the DNA as people live there longer and longer in um, very high radiation environments. Shelby, do you want to answer Joe's question? Uh, yeah, I'll save it. Okay. So did we, did we save it or not? Or? I have to save it. There's an option to save. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? <clears throat> so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you've got a BA in astronomy or physics at this point. Are you? Uh, yeah, I've got a bachelor's working? in astronomy. Are you still or working? a bachelor's in physics with a minor in astronomy? But I've been working with the U since 2003, doing uh, 2005, yeah. doing stuff upstairs. So you're going to try to do any postdoc, or you're just you yeah. cruising along on your BA? Or? Depends on how far I want to. Yeah, no, I've just been doing this, um, spreading the word of astronomy. Well, thanks for your many years of service up there. I know <laughs> I've always enjoyed it when I've gone up there. And yeah, fun. And thanks to our video producer, Shelby. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, and thanks for Joe for having us come to this and setting it up. So All right, so I think right. we're ready to wrap up the video yep. portion. And I think we're, we're done uh, for the night. And yep.